Welcome to Returning to Work, Practicalities Involved and What You Need to Do. This is Crisis Practice Support Webinar Number 2, and it is presented by Justin Purcell and Susan Webster. You're, you're very welcome to this uh, webinar number three from the Crisis uh, Practice Support webinar. Um, and today we're going to be discussing uh, the return to on-site uh, working, or the return to work, as some people say. But I think uh, in reality, everybody's been working really hard at home. So it's really the return to on-site working. So I'm really happy to have uh, uh, Susan Webster joining me on the call and uh, David Bell from the, from the HR department, also a, a lawyer as well. So uh, guys, if you want to just introduce yourselves there and come onto the call, that would be great. I know we've uh, muted the videos just to uh, improve the, uh, the the sound quality, which is... So, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is... Hi. Hi, Justin. Yeah, uh, David Bell is my name. I'm the managing director of a, a company called the HR Department. I qualified as a solicitor in 93 and left practice uh, 2002 and then uh, worked um, and set up this business in 2006. So we just provide... HR support to businesses, and I deal primarily with the employment law side of things. So yeah, that's great. So you should be able to give us some really, really good, valid uh, insights into this whole return to work uh, on-site working issue. So Susan, are you there? I am. I'm right here. I grant. Okay. Well, I'll, I'm delighted to be here today for the third uh, webinar. Okay. So we'll just move on to. Uh, so the government have announced. Uh, five different phases as to how we're going to get uh, move back to work and there are different sort of criteria laid out around uh, the different phases and how people go back to work i think everybody is kind of has been faced maybe with a little bit of a blizzard of different types of information from your local enterprise office or from from the government departments or from ourselves or from health and safety around what's required in actually moving back to work so hopefully we can clarify some of those practical issues today uh, and then maybe just discuss specifically from a legal practice point of view um, uh, what, what's involved in starting uh, or, or moving back to work. So we know that there's different types. People have interpreted the essential services uh, slightly differently. So some people are already back at work in, in some guise or form. Others are considering going back to work on the 8th of June, which seems to be a, a reasonable day to go back on. Uh, and then other people are going to continue the... Um, uh, remote working. So, moving on, then what we, uh, uh, what we had discussed earlier was that there's a number of practical issues that we'd like to kind of spend the call discussing. Um, so, if you're out there and you want to contribute, uh, send in a, a, a query um, from uh, on the chat, and myself and David and Susan will, will, will happily happily deal with that. So, David, do you want to come in here for a second and just talk about some of the practical challenges and practical issues that you've been hearing out there? Without stating the obvious, obviously, health and safety is the primary driver here, but there are a number of things that, that obviously all employers have to do uh, before they can ask staff to come back in. So, as Justin alluded to there, I think that the first thing is the opening of the actual building. Um, and for a number of different reasons which we'll go into, I think the remote working where it's possible should be still considered. I think, you know, I, I mentioned earlier on when I was talking to Justin and Susan that one of my clients is saying they're not going to open till August because they can all work remotely. They have a very good IT system. Obviously, that doesn't apply to everyone. And some people might be struggling with the concept. So I think where possible, that should be considered um, to be kept in, as an option for people, uh, either either on a permanent basis, as in for the time being, that all they do is re work remotely or to uh, support any entry back into the workplace. Um, I think the protocol itself is lengthy. I suppose everyone on the call is used to reading <laughs> lengthy and somewhat complicated, but it is yet another thing to read. But I do think it's worthwhile reading the protocol. Uh, some people, offices, you know, anecdotally here, people haven't actually shut their buildings. They might be going in and out. But where staff are coming back, I think it is important that, you know, you read the return to work protocol. And, um, uh, you know, it mentions there, that, as I said, the risk assessment. So some people are carrying that out themselves if they have some capacity or have done a risk assessment in the past. And if it's an office based, obviously it's not 
shouldn't be overly complicated, but it might be worth considering getting someone in to help you do that purely on the COVID side of things. Um, they talk about someone being appointed to manage the COVID. Uh, it's referred there in the slide to a health and safety officer uh, managing the COVID situation in the workplace. That could be one of the partners or senior partner or whoever it might be, or if there's an office manager or someone like that, but they would need to be very much up to speed. So I, oh, there's no sound. I'm getting text here, um, Justin. Okay, I can hear you, David. I don't know. Can you hear me, Justin? I can hear you. Oh, sorry, yeah, Fergus is helping so, there. So there yeah, may be a slight delay in. Yeah, the sorry, no, some uh, people are just commenting. Yeah. Um, so, so David, just going back to just like first steps and like, what would I need to do if yeah. I'm set, if I'm yeah. a so, legal practitioner uh, at the moment? What What are the next steps? I'm going to go back to work on June the eighth. I think that that's fairly clear that that's legal and, and that's allowed. What should I be doing? Okay. Well, I think I think what what again what we're advised people are do is to is to go in if it's the someone whoever's making the decision go in and sort of nearly pretend that work is back and what are the issues that you're going to have and people are getting down to literally the minutia of so for example one thing contract tracing we've all heard about it and so therefore if you don't have this already some form of sign-in sheet down to the sense that people are being told to use your own pen so you don't tie a biro to the sign-in sheet and have everyone sign it because there is a point of potential contact that people can pick up if someone has got the virus and they use their hand so door handles i mean uh Anyone involved in the sports clubs will have seen that they've taken all the doors off the tennis courts and the golf clubs, all the exit and entry points have been removed for that reason. So you have to look at having sanitation points in the building. Um, obviously, people should only be going into offices that they need to go into. Um, look at your canteen facilities. Do you keep it open? And if you are going to keep it open, what limitations are you going to have and who can go in there? How many people can be there at a time? Um, how what a cleaning arrangements are you going to have? So are you going to get your office deep cleaned before you go back? Are you going to get it cleaned? That, there's no guidelines as yet, but they are talking about sanitation of certain things. If you have a keypad to get in and out of the office, how are you going to operate that? Um, so these are the practical things. You literally have to nearly stand there and say, okay, if I was going in to work today, and that's just an individual coming in and out, uh, I think for the particular group that we have on the call, uh, you know, some of the staff might be concerned about how many clients are going to be coming in. It's a traditional way of, I presume, of going into the office where there's a receptionist or someone going to meet the person. They sit in a waiting room. The solicitor who's meeting them or whoever's coming to that, is that going to have to be looked at? Should they be brought straight to the meeting room by the person who's meeting them, not by anyone in reception? So uh, teas and coffees, water, all of these things are, are being considered. So, uh, so it's initial, definitely going initial, to change yeah. in, in, in so many ways. Certainly initially, I think how, how you go about. So sorry, David, sorry, sorry to cut over you there. So initially the, the company sorry, or, or the practice is going to have to perform a risk assessment of the practice. Yeah. Yes, on, 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 that, on along those lines, if someone's doing it themselves, that's what they need to look at. If they're bringing in someone to do it, all the better. They should be looking at all those things. So it's really important that a risk assessment is done and that, that the risks are documented uh, in some sort of a, a written uh, protocol or a written file so that if the health and safety were to make a visit to your to your premises that you would be able to document how you'd conducted the, the risk of the health and safety or risk assessment with regards to your practice and then what uh, changes or, or or steps you took to uh, make sure that the the the, 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 the site you've done make some ch uh, changes to make it more COVID nineteen uh, uh, friendly is probably the wrong word, but uh, that that you were uh, making it a healthy and safety environment for workers to work in. So it's important that you conduct a risk Com assessment. Compliance, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, a compliance. So you can uh, conduct this yeah. risk assessment. It has to be written. It has to be documented and it has to be available for other people to see. That would kind of be a first step. And then once then you've made those remedies um, and there are remedies around, you know, the, the two meter social distancing, uh, the use of pens, you know, the, this common sense, you know, uh, keeping people apart, not sharing items, restricting the number of clients coming to the offices only on a, on a really important needs, need by need basis that the person who greets them at the door is probably the person who 
uh, is the person who brings them to the meeting room, which brings up this issue around the role of reception staff. Uh, so a lot of this, as Magella is saying on, on the chat there, the risk and safety assessments are contained in the safety uh, statements. So all risks should be, need to be listed and the categories with timelines to re remedy the risks. So it's really important that you have this uh, information documented. Um, and then on the day itself of people coming back or prior mm -hmm. to that, there needs to be some the, yeah. the, the, the return to work uh, protocol or uh, the, 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 the form that staff need to fill out prior to coming back to work? Yeah, so there is a, uh, yes, there is a form that needs to be signed by uh, all staff returning to the building uh, th within three days of returning. So um, uh, I'll see if I can share my screen. I have, I, oh, I'm not sure if I can here, but basically if, if you just look at the protocol, it sets out what you're required to ask and it, again it's sort of obvious but there's a number of questions that they have to declare uh, the, that the answer is no to so it's a sort of a yes and no around symptoms of uh, high fever temperature etc have they been confirmed or suspected last 14 days have they been in contact with anyone so it's obviously asking the staff members to confirm these and if they answer yes to any of the questions they are advised uh, to you, you were advised an authority to get them to seek medical advice uh, because they possibly might have to quarantine uh, and if they say no they sign the declaration and that's returned to someone nominated in the office and kept on file uh, again it's a declaration to say that they're not and uh, now one of the things that has come up possibly in that is that someone has had COVID uh, of which no doubt there will be or uh, that that is a question of do they need a fit to re fitness to return to work certificate uh, and again I suppose that would be left up to the individual employer but some employers are insisting that if someone has had the illness that they get cleared fit to return by a doctor before they come back to the office. Because I was thinking I mean even before we looked at the the um, practicalities of returning to the colleagues over the last few weeks and some which I was really surprised about are actually working in their office some are working in their office with staff all very safely they've told me and um, others are working from home and are going to continue to work from home even after August once that phased work starts coming in and uh, so that's one question I had as to what are other colleagues doing and when are they thinking they might return and uh, address these issues. But the other thing, which is, I think, again, in a way, it's people who have children. I'm obliged to don't tell clients you're having children, etc. And I think now we need to be much more open and vocal because we all have different personal life circumstances. As, and in this pandemic, it's really important that we all support each other and see um, what we can do to uh, kind of row in together. So I do have young children. and. Um, and so for colleagues who have children and who have no child care because no child care is coming into your house or you're not leaving your children with any child huge issue for people how um, are you going to manage the child care issue with your office being open so that's what i'm really interested in finding out from um okay so that's that's a really good point so we we, we had indicated that we wanted to talk about this so staff concerns and yeah, child care issues and how do we address some of them. David, do you want to just talk a little bit about that? And the other it, I think Susan was asking what people are um, are thinking of doing with staff who are unable, who will want to come in but are unable to go um, uh, uh, to go into work uh, and obviously balance uh, child care where there's no child care available to them. Um, and obviously that will apply to a lot of people. Um, and the other thing as well, and I know some of the questions are coming up around PPE. Uh, again, you know, we, we've seen the change, slight change of heart with the government in relation to face masks. Um, I, again, I think as part of the uh, part of the risk assessment, some people are mentioning they have put up those spit shields in the reception. You've seen them in the supermarkets and the garages uh, throughout the emergency. So people may that may be part of your risk assessment that you put that in place. And uh, that might come from uh, the staff member who's going to be sitting there, but it probably does make sense if you are going to have a man's reception that you have some sort of protection for that person. Um, um, so I think the PPE is another thing. Do people wear it in work? Uh, some people are uncomfortable. Some people don't want to wear it. Others do. So I think the jury is a bit out on whether PPE or the masks are effective or not. Uh, it seems to be they help 
uh, protect others if there's a possibility of an infection, but only really where social distancing isn't um, uh, where, where social distancing isn't possible. There's other questions I think coming in about clients and people are making suggestions. Some are saying they don't, they're not meeting any clients. Others are saying it can be worked well if you have uh, just one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, uh, someone also asked, what if the client wants to use the toilet, which is an interesting one. Again, I think the bottom line throughout all of this, and I'm looking at this from a, your obligations to protect your staff as we all are, uh, and what issues they might raise is that the lack, the, the less, uh, I suppose, interaction and movement and people um, utilizing things in the office and uh, the better, I think that's the primary thing. Um, so just another thing to take up on Susan's point, one of the other issues I think it's mentioned there um, a, about the underlying conditions that you are going to be possibly asking your staff uh, if anyone has an underlying condition or they may they may wish to tell you that the reason that they can't come into work even if you have taken what you consider to be the appropriate steps to make the safe workplace safe uh, is that they have an underlying condition or a, a pre-existing condition or they just have a fear or they may be pregnant I mean pregnancy is seen as a, as a relatively high risk in terms of the, the overall COVID emergency um, how are you going to manage that and again these are all very challenging questions for a lot of people um, uh, but you do have to bear in mind that you may be asking questions you don't know the answer to and there is obviously the, the, the private and confidentiality element to that but also uh, you know there are obligations under the Equality Act about reasonable facilitation and, and, and without going into what that might be these are going to be challenges so that applies I think as well um, as Susan raised about the, the people with sort of family status and their their situation, but also will apply to staff members. Uh, and I'm seeing this uh, already where people are uh, being told that staff members are going to refuse for the time being to come in. And it's not a standoff, it's just a genuine reason. And it may be that you can work around it, but you might have to start looking at uh, shift working, maybe people coming in earlier so there's not so many people in the office. Um, and and also, you know, moving people, move, moving people's day around so that uh, there isn't as many people there, and to facilitate to to reduce the risk of infection. So these are the practical issues that I think some of you are going to face, uh, or may already have faced. Very very good, David. And a query there from Magella about data protection and like keeping on hand inform uh, private uh, information around people's health staff's healthcare. And this tension between employers and staff, and the other issue, the other issue we kind of raised was annual leave and that, that whole management process. Do you have any thoughts around that? And Susan, if you're there and you would like to come in, yeah. Well, I think the data protection is clearly, you know. Go ahead, David. You keep going. Oh, sorry. No, yeah. No, I think the data protection. Like, I'm certainly in a in a, in a with uh, over 200 lawyers. I'm not going to be opining on data protection but clearly it is going to increase your obligation so if you are holding information that becomes apparent because of this uh, obviously your your obligations under the uh, data protection act are going to be increased you know it may very well be that they you don't have to hold that information for very long or it can be done uh, whether you want an email or you want a medical search if you if you start looking for certification of it but if if someone comes to you and says, look, I didn't told you this before, but I have an issue, um, that may be all you need. It just depends on the size of the company, obviously, the amount of it, and the impact. Um, and the other thing that Justin mentioned, and again, these are practical queries that people might have to deal with, and are, again, are probably already thinking about, is the annual leave. And it is this fine balance. You've seen a lot of coverage in the press about employers asking uh, people to um, take annual leave before uh, they come back um, and um, our erstwhile colleague Richard Grogan who a lot of you would have seen has been very vocal on this uh, and, and correctly in fairness to him so he's saying basically you can't force people to take holidays uh, unless you give them a month's notice so that's the first thing so people are concerned about a build-up of annual leave so traditionally people around Easter would have taken holidays March people like may have been away May June holidays would have been taken so Pretty much no one has taken that much leave, I would imagine, over the last few months. 
So there's a build up now that has to be done and people want to make sure that people take annual leave, but then they don't want to leave the business <laughs> uh, uh, with short staff. If everyone suddenly comes in and, and one of the things that I you know, just have a thought of is that when the 20th of July comes, when the caravan parks and the campsites and the travel in, even in Ireland is going to be lifted, are suddenly people going to want to get away? Uh, this, it's been a very difficult time for all of us uh, in so many ways that if you suddenly get a raft of applications for um, for uh, holidays, are you, how you're going to manage that? So either preempted by starting to say to people, look, I, I'm going to reserve the right to, to, to hold off any uh, approvals of holidays for the time being till I see what the, the sort of the next few months look like or else and I say balancing that with by asking people to, to take holidays so I, I think that's just again something to be aware of that if you start getting a whole load of requests how you're going to manage that and, and try and have maybe given some thought to that um, mm. I see Justin sorry Hillary's asked about taking temperature and again yeah that's something that uh, one of my clients uh, we, we have a couple of schools and that's something that that people are talking about there was I saw one interpretation saying it's mandatory but my reading of it is it's not it, it's a recommendation um, I think there's a few scare stories about uh, employees who may not get paid and this is another thing we can touch on on sick leave if they're sick uh, that they'll be chewing paracetamol mm. to reduce their temperature uh, look I don't I don't know I, that that's, that brings its own issues doesn't it if people are doing that but you know there is going to be a concern uh, again from a data protection from a safety there are a number of devices out there that you can take temperatures obviously now without uh, you know using a thermometer of that nature I think there's some but I, I think first and foremost people are looking at uh, getting people to declare as they are and obviously you need to have a protocol in place where someone does get sick either in the workplace or or obviously if they feel sick uh, and they're showing any symptoms while work is going on and before they come in they shouldn't come in uh, and uh, so uh, I, there is that whole part of reminding um, staff and it, it is linked to the return to work there's an obligation to do some training uh, you know some of my clients we've, we, we've put together it's only very modest I have to say but like a slide deck of about 15 slides just reminding people on the protocols washing hands all of those things uh, that might be worth going through or sending out to people before they come back. Um, yeah. So, uh, and I know, uh, uh, you know, I think there's things like that, that, you know, that could be useful. Yeah. Yeah. So I know, I know we, we, we put together a whole long set of slides and they're all like, that's a really fa fanta fantastic insights. And I know we're coming to the end of the sort of 30 minutes that we sort of allowed. So I won't bore everybody by going through each of the slides. We're going to share them with everybody. Uh, I thought we had already, but, um, we, we will definitely make sure that everyone gets the slides, which goes into all of that detail that David has, uh, has very kindly shared with us today. So in, 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 the, in the sort of last minute or two minutes, if anyone has any yeah. particular questions they want to ask us now, uh, just if you could send it up on the chat, uh, that would be great. Uh, I won't go through each of the, uh, uh, of the slides, but they do go into more information and give some, some useful links on where to go. We'll make sure everybody gets a copy of them for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, and can I just say, David, is be, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm really conscious that my sound might be yes. patchy. But just to say, David, yeah. you've just been a wealth of information. And I think it's so important that people hear your experience, as you're saying, with other clients and what other people are doing. Because we all, of course, have to read the protocol, make sure that we um, see how that fits us best, have our safety statements, do our risk assessment. But it's the anecdotal things that other what other people are doing and other colleagues are doing that's really helpful and really useful to us uh, I think so I, I just want to say thanks it's been great uh, listening to you and sorry about my sound quality okay thank, thanks Susan all right so and, and that's very good thank you Susan and uh, Justin I see um Veronica was asking for the slide sorry for the slides I you know I can I can give them to you if you wanted to you know with the usual caveat the, this is just a work in progress just something i'm working on with one of the clients they're very straightforward but okay everybody so uh okay thanks for joining us on, on webinar number three there were a few just final wrap-up queries there um uh, from people so just still this balancing questions from tom around mm -hmm. the staff versus uh just you know the the importance of, of looking after everybody and you know how, how dangerous the situation is and you know taking all of these measures 
you know, I still think, you know, people really need to be cognizant of how dangerous this virus is uh, and doing all of these things while will minimize the risk. They won't eliminate the risk. And there is, it's very hard to eliminate. Uh, so uh, everyone out there, try to stay safe. We, I'm undoubtedly return to this issue again. Thanks, Susan, again, for your, for, for your useful comments. And, and David, if you guys want to make a final comment, that would be great. If not, Everyone stay safe. We'll share the slides. We'll share the audio. And uh, we'll see you again on our next uh, webinar next week, which is uh, covering mental health. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Okay. Thanks, David. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye.